Good afternoon. Welcome to this year's inaugural event of the World Leaders Forum at Columbia University. I'd like to begin by noting what a remarkable opportunity this forum has been for the entire Columbia com community, from students to faculty to alumni to guests from New York City and around the world. Indeed, we have grown accustomed to beginning the fall at Columbia year after year with the notable excitement and interest generated by the World Leaders Forum. This is, after all, an experience that would be difficult, if not impossible, to duplicate in any other city or at any other university in the world. Today we begin the World Leaders Forum with a timely discussion about the prevention and treatment of non-communicable diseases in developing countries. <clears throat> diseases such as cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and chronic respiratory disease. <clears throat> Our gathering here coincides with meetings today and tomorrow at the United Nations to address this subject in a high-level ministerial forum that last convened 10 years ago to confront HIV AIDS. I should add, with very productive results. Several of the people with us today are centrally involved in this week's UN deliberations. Though you will hear more formal introductions momentarily, I do want to say on behalf of the university that we are delighted to be joined here by this extraordinary group of people. Moderator Dr. Sanjay Gupta, Columbia faculty member Dr. Wafa El Sadr, Dr. Lawrence Schulman of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Dr. Paul Farmer, who is returning to this campus, having been here not long ago to receive an honorary degree. And Lance Armstrong, who has done so much to support research and advocacy to combat cancer. For those in the audience who are new to this subject, you may be shocked to learn the numbers of people suffering from non-communicable disease in poor countries and the staggering rates of increase in the afflicted populations. It is a burgeoning, burgeoning global health problem that in the past has lacked concerted advocacy. But that is literally changing as we speak in large measure because of the efforts of these panelists and their allies. When this afternoon's conference is completed and the questions asked and answered, I expect many of you will come away with new ideas about our collective priorities for improving global health. The subject of this forum reminds us that given the inception of the World Leaders Forum nine years ago, it has provided unlimited attention not only to political and government leaders but beyond to every sector. We have welcomed and learned from speakers and panelists from the worlds of art, science, business, law, public policy, and public health, each different discipline offering different insights. We have had in the recent past a forum on women and leadership in the 21st century with extensive participation from Columbia students and also a forum called Conversations with America featuring the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mike Mullen. The goal of the World Leaders Forum is to be as embracing as the academic community that is Columbia. The value of convening these events at our university comes above all from our ability to bring together such a diverse group of students and faculty and researchers to consider the great issues of the day. With that in mind, I want to thank this impressive audience of Columbians for being here, and I also want to welcome and thank our next speaker and one of today's hosts, Dr. Linda Freed, the Dean of the Mailman School of Public Health. The Mailman School is recognized around the world for its leadership in studying and responding to health problems affecting millions of people in developed and developing nations, as well as the health concerns closer to home for residents of New York City. 
the subjects attracting the Mailman School of Attention and expertise range from HIV AIDS to maternal health to the non-communicable diseases that are our subject today. Thank you and please welcome Dr. Linda Fried. <coughs> Thank you, President Bollinger, and welcome to this wonderful audience and to our distinguished panelists today. We are thrilled to be able to host this very important conversation. I have the opportunity to follow on what President Bollinger just said to share with you briefly what the Mailman School is doing in the area of non-communicable diseases, or NCDs, and I'll do that very briefly. As this group, of course, knows, the Mailman School of Public Health is situated locally at Columbia University's Medical Center campus in Washington Heights, but our reach is truly global. With faculty who have worked globally for decades, they are leading innovative programs in 105 countries around the world. And our 1,200 master's and doctoral students represent not just most of the states in the United States, but some 40 nations worldwide. Our faculty lead on solving 21st century challenges of how to create health for all of us globally through the science and practice of prevention and implementation and focusing on the creation of sustainable health systems that, through knowledge, can meet the 21st century health needs of populations around the corner and around the globe. Our school, of course, is enriched and our focus informed by the presence of our world-renowned research centers and practice centers, including the International Center for AIDS Programs, the Center for Infection and Immunity, and the National Center for Disaster Preparedness, and key initiatives such as our significant chronic disease initiative, which serves as an interdisciplinary and even transdisciplinary think tank of faculty and leaders school-wide in addressing the public health challenge, the major public health challenge of how we prevent and better care for people with chronic diseases, non-communicable diseases, for the next generations. Many of our school's leaders in this area are participating in this week's UN Summit on NCDs and leading independent discussions on the topic as well as other global health challenges. As this audience knows, non-communicable diseases, also referred sometimes as chronic diseases, place enormous burdens on nations and people around the globe. The physical toll alone should be enough, accounting for 63% of the world's health burdens. Yet the financial drain is also extraordinary. In 2005, for example, the estimated losses in national income from heart disease, stroke, and diabetes were $18 billion in China, $11 billion in the Russian Federation, $9 billion in India, and $3 billion in Brazil. Non-communicable diseases are the majority cause of morbidity and mortality in both developing and developed countries, with developing countries now bearing the greatest burden. According to the World Health Organization, nearly 80% of non-communicable disease deaths, heart disease, stroke, chronic respiratory disease, diabetes, and cancers, occur in low- and middle-income countries two-thirds of cancer deaths occur in such nations. These are no longer diseases of the rich. In fact, as a result of globalization of lifestyles, people worldwide have adopted rapidly many of the same adverse lifestyles that led to the epidemic of chronic diseases in the Western world in the 20th century. Consumption of processed foods, rich in fat, salt, and sugar, increased amounts of food intake, low physical activity, and tobacco use. In fact, you might say that non-communicable diseases have proven to be communicable. The encouraging news is that, in many cases, prevention works, and that we now know a lot about the health system designs and treatments that can improve health 
integrating public health and medical care approaches into next generation health systems. It is estimated that at least 80% of heart disease, stroke, and type 2 diabetes, and 40% of cancers are highly preventable. Adopting a life course approach to chronic disease prevention can have an immediate and favorable impact on outcomes for people of every age and set the stage for longer lives lived in health. True progress is often heralded by the bridging of great divides, whether it's science and knowledge with practice and policy, or geographical, cultural, intellectual, technological, educational, or digital ones. Accordingly, we must employ science and, adva and advanced knowledge toward the adoption of evidence-based strategies, structures, and tools and new kinds of systems and a use of effective treatments and prevention so that we can make great progress in stemming the growth of non-communicable diseases and in promoting health and healthy futures around the globe. So with that background, of course, our distinguished panel will have much to say on this topic. And so without further ado, it is my deep pleasure to introduce our moderator, Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Dr. Gupta, of course, is a very familiar face internationally as the Emmy Award-winning Chief Medical Correspondent for CNN. He is a practicing neurosurgeon and plays an integral role in CNN's reporting on health and medical news for American Morning, Anderson Cooper 360, and CNN documentaries. He anchors his own weekend medical affairs program entitled Sanjay Gupta, MD, and is a frequent contributor to CNN.com and CNNHealth.com. Dr. Gupta's medical training and public health policy experience distinguish his reporting on a range of medical and scientific topics, including cancer, fitness, healthcare reform, brain injury, disaster recovery, HIV AIDS, and many others. In addition to his work for CNN, Dr. Gupta is a member of the staff and faculty of the Emory University School of Medicine, where he is Associate Chief of Neurosurgery. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Gupta, who will introduce our distinguished panelists and moderate today's session. Dr. Gupta. Thank you. Thanks, Dean Freed. Appreciate that. I got to shorten my bio, I think, a little bit. Um, this is a beautiful, beautiful hall, and I'm really just very excited uh, to, to be here. And I'm also just really impressed with the attendance as well to talk about this uh, particular topic. I'm not sure, is this, is this how all Columbia classrooms are? Always fully attended? Um, it, this, is, this is an important topic, uh, no question. And I, I am particularly honored to be here because I think I care so deeply about the same things that our panel does and so many of you do. Uh, it's an important time, it's a historic time, uh, as we talk about this awesome task of trying to deliver hope. Uh, I can't think of anything greater than that, and, and no doubt we'll look upon this time decades from now and critically analyze the decisions that we made uh, everywhere across the world. Um, we will look not only at the decisions, but also get a real reflection, I think, of what we stand for as human beings living in this global society, and that will be critically examined as well. One of, the, one of the big reasons that we discuss non-communicable diseases now is because uh, there's a fair amount of awareness being generated uh, about this issue, but also I, I think that the idea that there are real solutions uh, that have become apparent, that have become effective, and that are already helping and saving people's lives, I think is tremendously exciting. Uh, these are solutions that I think may surprise you to some extent. They are solutions that may not have even been available 10 years ago the last time the UN General Assembly really decided to take on an issue like this. Um, so again, I, I'm very excited to be here. The panel, uh, as, they, as they say, really uh, truly needs no introduction because they are the, 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 the A-team of, of global health. But uh, Dr. Lawrence Schulman is here. He's Chief of Oncology at Dana-Farber. He's also a Senior Advisor in Oncology at Partners in Health, uh, Co-Chair of the Global Task Force on Expanding Access to Cancer Care uh, in Developing Countries. Um, Dr. Paul Farmer, uh, a good friend of mine, co-founder of Partners in Health. Uh, he's also UN Deputy Special Envoy to Haiti. 
Um, he, he has uh, done some remarkable work around the world, written several books, and I think uh, in many ways inspired an entire generation of people to do the exact sort of work that he's doing. Um, Lance Armstrong is, is uh, uh, another good friend. I sit on the board. Uh, I'm honored to sit on the board of his organization, Live Strong. Um, I think as far as what he has done at the grassroots level for people all over the world, it, it's, it's truly remarkable. Uh, he himself, a cancer survivor, as you know, after beating that back, going on to win uh, the Tour de France seven years in a row. And I should point out as well, uh, he's remarkably cogent and coherent today, given that this past weekend was his 40th birthday, uh, which he celebrated. It was a very good time. We, we won't sing to you now, but there was some singing before. Uh, Dr. Wafel Sauter, uh, who's an MD and an MPH, uh, she is one of your own. Uh, she comes from the ranks here at Columbia, professor of epidemiology, and she also leads the Global Health Initiative, uh, has some real insights on what we've learned over the last 10 years, specifically with communicable diseases and how we can apply them to the topic at hand today. So please welcome this panel. We're, we're going to spend about uh, 20, 25 minutes having a discussion. After that, I'd like to open it up to all of you. Uh, at about quarter to five, we'll do that. Uh, so if you have questions, there's a couple of mics on either side of the room. Um, before we get started, though, we're going to show you a, a short video. It's called Delivering Hope and sort of frames a discussion that we're about to have. So take a look at this. <laughs> أنا ما في حياة. لما أسمع كلمة سرطان يعني شيء يخوف يعني شيء مرعب. وموافق يعني بداية يعني خلص بداية النهاية للإنسان. It's clear now to everybody who's paying attention that chronic diseases, non-communicable diseases like cancer, are accounting for most of the world's deaths. They can be treated, they can be prevented, and they can be addressed in some of the toughest places around the world. I believe everybody has a right to live. And, uh, and most people die because they don't have the capacity to, you know, to get treatment. <laughs> Cuando hay algún cáncer, es una memoria muy, porque haber mucha gente, pues no podríamos pagar las quimioterapias. And spending in health is not a consumption, it's not an expenditure, it is an investment. And that not spending enough in health is bad economic policy. We've not put the type of attention into cancer care, prevention, education, and treatment in many areas of the world that we should have, and we need to make that difference in the coming decades. If we ignore that, it's irresponsible on our part. Let's get started. Um, ladies first. Dr. Al Sadr, let, 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 me, let me start by asking, I think you get a pretty good idea uh, of the answer to this, but, but why now do you think the UN General Assembly has decided to take this on? Has something changed and has it been a reflection uh, toward communicable diseases as well at all? Um, I, I believe it's long overdue uh, for the nations of the world and the UN to 
pay particular attention to this crisis in NCDs. And uh, there are lots of reasons why this is the right time. I think it's a confluence of um, a lot of factors that are, have come together to highlight the, the crisis that, is, that we're all experiencing around the world. Uh, for example, the uh, environmental degradation and the impact on health. Uh, another example is the, uh, the, the availability of actual innovations and interventions that can be done about it. I think the coming together of communities across the world that represent versus stakeholders, they're really identifying ways in which one can address these issues from the medical perspective, from the public health perspective, from the legal perspective, uh, and then from a community-based perspective as well. And finally, I think what's very important to, to realize that over the past decade, since the last uh, summit that the UN had, which really dealt with HIV AIDS, I think we've learned uh, what's possible. Mm -hmm. And that's very important, is the world has learned and the countries themselves <coughs> have learned and the leadership of these countries have learned. It is possible if we come together and we put the resources and we take the lessons learned and identify the, the mechanisms and the possibilities and um, bring together and catalyze the partnerships and so on, that it is possible to make remarkable achievements in tackling uh, such important and very uh, critical issues as has been accomplished to date with HIV. And we're going to talk very specifically about what some of those solutions are. But Dr. Shulman, l let me ask you, j just the significance of, of having this topic uh, being addressed here at the UN General Assembly, what, what does it really mean to someone like you uh, after this conference is over? Well, you know, I've spent three decades working on treatments for cancer here in the U.S mostly at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. And we have affordable, curable, curative treatments for many, many of our patients that if you live in the wrong place, you have no access to. You know, so people who live in sub-Saharan Africa or parts of Asia or Haiti, many of the other places that we work, um, eight-year-old, 10-year-old kids, or like Francine in the film, who was 11 when she presented with her tumor to one of Paul's sites, um, she has a curable disease. She is cured. You know, it's four years later. I visited her in July. And how can we not take the treatments we've developed that are quite affordable and quite administratable, if you will? We can give those in the most resource poor settings in the world and take somebody like Francine, who would have died shortly after that first picture that you saw, and let her have a normal long life. And I think that's a responsibility we have to take. Uh, Dr. Paul Farmer, uh, Francine uh, was one of the first patients, uh, if I'm correct, uh, treated in Rwanda, Renkwavu Hospital, which, which I visited. Uh, first of all, if you could tell a little bit more about her story. She, she had a rhabdomyosarcoma, is my understanding. Uh, was that a transition point in terms of how you thought about uh, communicable and then to non-communicable diseases? Well, I, I was actually on call the night that she came in. It was nighttime, if I'm not mistaken, and I just remember there was, uh, you know, she came, her father had been wandering around the country with her, I th and again, I'd have to go back, maybe you remember the history, for a couple weeks is my recollection. And this has been the story again and again. So for me, it wasn't a transition at all. I and mean, I've been doing this for 25 years. It, the same story in Haiti and, you know, everywhere in the world, you know, families will make every effort to bring their children or other family members to cure. And so the, we were forced, uh, I was forced in any case, um, in the early 80s when I was still in medical school uh, to contemplate these very complex illnesses. But I, so the point of transition was really a, very often for our Rwandan colleagues, some of the people that you, who you met in, when you were first there, and I think you were there in the first summer, we were there in 2005, and also for some of our American colleagues um, who had been trained in their expectations. Uh, and, and again, this is why I'm proud to be here uh, with my friend and colleague, Wafel Sader, who, who will remember these lowered expectations. You're working in a place in rural Africa. You're told that it's not cost effective to make X, where, X Y, or Z intervention. And then you have to fight that. You have to reimagine what it would be like not to be born poor and sick or to become uh, sick when you're poor. But for that family, you know, they had really already exhausted their resources just wandering around fruitlessly. 
And um, so, you know, we, we were already aware from our Harvard-Haiti connection about the possibility of getting chemotherapy. And I just went uh, uh, to my uh, friends at Dana-Farber and, and the Brigham and said, here's the, here's the path. I'm probably going to end up um, going to jail. Lee, maybe Lee can get me out of jail for carrying path specimens in my bags. But, you know, you get to uh, try to do it legally if yeah. you're going to do this. Get the path specimens back. That's the, that's the first the piece of advice you're giving to the audience. Yeah, the young people legally. especially always follow the rules, <laughs> not. Anyway, uh, you know, you, you, it's not, I, I said once to Larry Schulman, it's not rocket science. Said, well, my, my sister actually is a rocket scientist, so. <laughs> My sister is. So. Yeah, not my sister. Um, and, you know, you get the diagnosis, you find the meds, and you deliver it. We have a good system we built up over the years, first in, in Haiti and, and now in several sites in Africa. And, again, it's doable. We, what we need is the imagination and the political will. And that's what's happening, I think, at UNGAS, the UN General Assembly. And I'll, I'll let other people talk, but I think it's great that this is finally happening again. Only the second time in the history of the UN that there have been health-related uh, general assemblies. The first one was AIDS, and now we're at NCD. So we've got to make it worth, worth everybody's while. Almost, almost exactly 10 years later. And Lance, I mean, this is something you've been talking about for some time, taking the message of Livestrong uh, around the world, uh, because this is a, uh, an, uh, obviously an issue that is, that is global. But what, what, what do you think the relationship between uh, NGOs, uh, uh, grassroots organizations, activist organizations, should be, uh, the relationship be, should be with the government and, and ministries of health around the world. Well, we, uh, we have been doing that a long time, and we did it first time. We were all from, our organization's from Austin, Texas, so we, we started in our home state, and our home, we're lucky that the capital is, is Austin, and we're based there, but we started in Texas, then we uh, took it to the United States, and then a couple of years ago, uh, we, we launched the global initiative in and around this this idea that I would get back on my bike and race again. Only one of those was a good idea. Um, <laughs> the global initiative part was the good idea, but uh, uh, I think it's I think it's important. I mean, I think um, I mean the governments need to hear from the people, obviously, who have been there, and and, and most of the NGOs, at least, is with our organization are, are people like myself who have who have been in the trenches they know what it's like to uh, to be diagnosed to be told you have cancer to try to navigate this system listening to these stories and watching the video uh, is, is pretty humbling I remember uh, I, 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 when I talk about my disease now I try to tell people I say listen when I was diagnosed in 96 we didn't have Google we didn't really even have the internet I mean we, I was going down to the bookstore so I was trying to navigate uh, my own diagnosis, as was my friends and family, by that place that nobody even remembers anymore called the bookstore, and asking friends and family and just word of mouth, literally wandering around. So just like her father was wandering, we were wandering around too, a little in a different way, but uh, times have rapid, you know, obviously changed and they're rapidly changing now. And so, uh, But I, I believe that the, um, the people that have been there and, and seen it and survived it are certainly the ones with the most passion. And that's the only thing I would add to what Paul said is, you know what is it going to take? And the last, the last element is the is is the the, the people part and the passion of the people. You got to have great smart, which is, I'm assuming this room is full of, but uh, great smart, passionate people that want to make a difference uh, in other people's lives. And I'm, and I'm going to ask you, Lance, a little bit later on, uh, specific advice for for students and young people who who really want to get involved in, in this sort of movement. But but Dr. Slaughter, let, let me ask you. I mean, people look at a disease uh, like cancer, uh, at least particular types of cancer, and say, look, as Lance was alluding to, it is complex sometimes to treat, it is costly to treat. Uh, how, it's hard to even do that in developed countries. How do you start to do that in the developing world? You've learned some things over the last 10 years. What, what can you tell us that gives us some hope? I think it's, uh, there are several things we've learned, and, I, and I, that's what I say, that we've learned what's possible. I think it's very important also whenever we're discussing NCDs to think of the prevention as well as the treatment, because particularly in the context of NCDs or HIV, communicable or non-communicable disease, there's a huge role to prevention as well. So we really should be trying not to get to the point in preventable can, uh, cancers or preventable uh, other conditions. We don't want to get to the point where people are desperately seeking care. We can really have a huge impact by focusing on prevention. And in a way, um, that's another lesson learned from HIV is that balance and finding the right balance between prevention and treatment is very important, but not losing sight of either. 
is very critical. Both are very important. So I distinctly remember a decade ago, uh, Paul, people said, no, forget about people with HIV. We should just be trying to prevent HIV. Many of us said, no, you have to deal with both. You have to do prevention, but you also have to deal with the people who are sick today. And uh, if we focus on the people who are sick today, there are lots of lessons learned and lots of ways of trying to enable individuals like you saw in this video to get the diagnosis, to get the right diagnosis, to get it done at the level where they're at, close to their home, to invest in some simple diagnostics, to invest in training the workforce, the healthcare workers, to diagnose these individuals, and then enabling the medications to be delivered, uh, training people how to deliver the medications, uh, building uh, multidisciplinary teams, the support that patients with cancer or support that patients with diabetes get in this country. It's a team effort to invest in helping to establish these teams that can provide not just the medicine, but everything else that people who are sick need, the social support, the outreach. The so I think there are lots of ways in which we can impact uh, and use very pragmatic methods uh, to try to impact on people who are sick, as well as obviously to try to uh, prevent these conditions in the first place. Well, and there are in, uh, a plethora of lessons learned from HIV that I think apply very easily to, for example, the management of cancer or heart disease or diabetes, uh, as an example. Right. And, and, and we should point out, it, it's heart disease, diabetes, cancer, lung disease that we're talking about primarily. But uh, Paul Farmer, when, when you talk about prevention specifically, I mean, some of this is obvious, right? Uh, we talk about tobacco, for example. We talk about some of the things Dean Fried talked about in terms of healthy diet, exercise. It, it strikes me in some of these developing countries, aside from tobacco, uh, there's not a lot of choice for people in terms of being able to prevent certain diseases. Uh, the foods that they have as, as options uh, are, are tough, uh, tougher than they are here. Uh, and, and even vaccinations, things that uh, you've talked about a lot, are, are not always easily accessible. How do you really address prevention in these places? Well, uh, yeah, as you, you know, we, t we had a talk a couple of years ago, you and I, about um, cervical cancer. Um, and I forget where we were. Where were we? <laughs> I think we uh, Dublin. I think Ireland, yes. <laughs> that was the day that Lance Armstrong asked me if I wanted to ride a bicycle with him, and I said, no, I do not, and left on the next plane. That, that, was, good. that was good for Paul's was, health, not to ride a bike with Lance yeah. Armstrong. In any case, <laughs> That's a good one, you know, if, you, if you go case by case, you know, I think the, the, there's a general and specific message. The general is, uh, as, as Wafa just said, you, you don't force families to choose between prevention and care. And, and again, our policy has to be smarter better. Our investments have to be smarter and better. How can we integrate in prevention and care? But if you take specific examples, and we could go to rheumatic heart disease um, or um, uh, complications uh, of, you know, coronary disease gets discussed a lot, but there are other afflictions of the heart that are uh, preventable. Um, and, and also you think a little bit about, again, going back to cervical cancer. We have a vaccine. It is a, you know, we call it a non-communicable disease, but it is actually you know, an infectious disease um, and a communicable one. We have vaccine. Um, we have early detection of cervical lesions, cervical cancer lesions that are easily curable, uh, as you know. So all the way down that chain, we need a series of interventions. And then you can talk about primary prevention, delayed on onset of uh, sexual activity among girls, uh, especially, will also prevent maternal mortality. I just did a an interview uh, with a reporter from ABC, I'm sorry Sanjay if that offends you, um, but uh, about maternal mortality and it's the same, if I may, the same kind of really silly argument between prevention and care. We have to integrate prevention and care even in thinking about problems like maternal mortality or cholera. And so I guess one of the big challenges, and you didn't ask me this question Sanjay, but I'd like to, to, to just say that there is a great benefit from what in public health gets termed a vertical intervention. So a cervical cancer program or a cholera treatment program or an HIV program. We've seen the benefits that can come out of it. And, but there's also a trap there, is that people are not readily divided into little compartments where you can have your prevention activities and your care activities. And we really need to build health systems, which is not a not a sexy topic, you know. So building health systems, it's what Partners in Health does, for example, um, is to build um, 
you know, clinics and hospitals and to train community health workers so that regardless of what the newest rebuke to health might be, and it's cholera in Haiti, we've got a system in place where we can, uh, one hopes we can integrate prevention and care very, very fully. And I think that's something that the next generation, like you said, the, the brains out here today and the passion and enthusiasm that are here today, I guess it was Lance who said that, um, we, we really need you to take on these very complex problems before us now. Um, the reporter in me has to, has to ask uh, a little bit about Gardasil. Uh, Lance's home state's governor has brought this up recently. And, uh, you know, because you what, gave what, that, is, that, what that, state are you from again? Because <laughs> you gave that interview to the other uh, network that. reporter. Were, were you not asking, paying attention to I the was first inattentive. part? You, you, you're an infectious disease doctor. You take care of uh, infectious diseases uh, and, and all sorts of diseases all over the world. Uh, what, what is the truth about Gardasil? There, there was a lot made of this, obviously, in the recent debate. Uh, what should people know about this vaccine? Well, I, I miss the debate, I'll confess. Um, and there are some illnesses for which there are no cure. Um, but uh, so Gardasil or is, is a vaccine that, uh, that probably prevents, and I, you know, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but probably 80% is more or less reasonable. More, um, it, it, it covers... The, the types of HPV, human papillomavirus, called serovars, the main ones that cause the disease. Now, some other, uh, there may be un, uh, what's, what a sociologist would term un, unanticipated consequences of our actions. For example, perhaps other strains of HPV will become dominant. But right now, we've got this great tool uh, that we should, in my view, and this is you know, a bit of a lob, I guess, but in my view, we should make that available as a public good. Now, it might not be the company's job to do that. It's the public sector. So in Rwanda, um, I hope all of you students get to meet um, Dr. Binigua, Dr. Agnes Binaguaho, who you met, and, and Wafa knows, who is the Minister of Health, of Health now of Rwanda. She is a pediatrician um, and uh, was, when we went there for the first time, uh, working with AIDS. Uh, she was the chairman of the National AIDS Committee. But she and others have done their own negotiations with the company. Why? To vaccinate every 13-year-old girl in Rwanda. That must be a very big investment. I don't know what, they're, you know, what they negotiated, but that's got to be a very significant investment. But it's such a smart investment, getting back to prevention and care. They know that the burden of disease later on is going to catch up with them. This is in, in the cervical cancer belt of Africa. They could really, we could see in our lifetimes, I believe, uh, really, we could see in Rwanda cervical cancer being wiped out as a significant public health threat. So I missed the debate, um, as I said. The, the, the question of the debate was more, should this be a mandatory vaccine? Why, why are you doing this? Me, <laughs> I mean, I, was I love you. To say there you don't have to answer that, because that's a, that's a, that's a whole other topic, and we'll get into it at another time. But, but Dr. Shum, let me ask you, when, when you think about a lot of these chronic or non-communicable diseases, people... Uh, think about people in developed nations. They think about people who are older, often wealthier, uh, a disease of affluence, they say. Who are the people suffering from NCDs around the world? Well, um, I'm a cancer doctor, so mostly I know who the cancer patients are. Uh, but you can really divide them up into a couple of major categories, and some of them, in fact, are infectious disease related. Uh, we've just talked about HPV and cervical cancer, hepatitis B, and hepatocellular cancer is one of the great cancer killers of the world, particularly in Asia and also in Africa. Uh, again, an infectious disease that you have a vaccine for. Um, and some of them we don't have vaccines for. So, you know, um, Burkitt's lymphoma, mm -hmm. with what in the U.S. causes infectious mono, Epstein-Barr virus, causes a malignant lymphoma in Africa. We don't know why, uh, but highly curable highly curable with cheap, easily available, easily administered chemotherapy. Some of these diseases aren't curable. You know, even in Boston, we can't cure even a small fraction of patients with hepatocellular cancer, but we can prevent it by reducing the frequency of hepatitis B and alcoholism um, and a number of other conditions. But um, you know, if you go to Rigwavu, where you've been, and I was a month or so ago, and Butaro, their other site in Rwanda, you see them come in. These are, you know, these are kids, young adults, older adults, who have really a full spectrum of cancers, 
some of which are preventable and some of which, at least in the next 20 years, are likely not to be preventable, but are quite curable. And, uh, and we have the tools to manage these. Uh, Lance was talking about back 15, 16 years ago when he was diagnosed. Mm -hmm. And I think, Lance, you told me uh, they essentially said it was a coins flip uh, chance of whether or not you would survive. Um, would, would Lance, if someone like had a disease like Lance in some of these places you're talking about, could they get treated now in, in the developing world? Um, so the, the answer is, you know, maybe in Lance's particular circumstance it would be tough. You know, some of the treatments Lance got, you got radiation, or just chemo. Um, and multiple surgeries. And multiple surgeries. You had neurosurgery, which I don't think we probably could do in Rwanda. Uh, we could administer the when treatment. when Sanjay gets <laughs> leaves at CNN, then we can do the neurosurgery in Rwanda, or just you know rewrite his job now. description, <laughs> you know. Um, but chip you know, in, will you? But Absolutely. one of the things we're trying to do in Rwanda is build surgical around, capacity. So this is your this is your <laughs> chance. Uh, but but the chemotherapy we could actually administer there. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna, yeah, go ahead. I'm going to let the people could start to, if you have questions, we're going to start opening this up here in a second. Go ahead. Dr. I think so. what's the challenge is also how to scale it up. I mean, I think it's very important to conceptualize this as, um, I think there's a, a tremendous amount of good work that's being done, almost the same way as with HIV. There were wonderful programs that Paul had initiated and ourselves at ICAP had. But the challenge for the global community is taking this to scale. And that's going to require a very careful analysis of right. what can be taken to scale. Uh, is it uh, which test can be taken to scale? Which kind of treatment can be taken to scale? What's taken to scale meaning that you can provide it as much coverage as possible to people who might be not able to come to a cancer center, who might be able to go to a health center in their community, who might be able to go to a district hospital. So it requires thinking about the health system mm -hmm. It requires thinking about dissecting exactly the prevention interventions, the treatment interventions, and carefully thinking about what's scalable. Because I think if we want to have a dent on the NCD epidemic or pandemic, it really requires thinking very carefully about successful models, but also examining them and then reflecting on what can be taken to scale. And I think that's the global challenge. Yeah. And that had to be done for other diseases that we've tackled is this concept of taking to scale and expanding coverage so we can, in the end, have equity. Mm -hmm. We can have people who are poor, who live in rural areas, uh, have access to interventions and have access to both prevention interventions and treatment interventions. So I think this is a very in important concept in our ability to, make a, to really making a dent in the NCD uh, epidemic. Right. If, uh, if, you, if you wouldn't mind, uh, just go ahead and say your name, if you would, uh, uh, maybe your affiliation, if you can. and. Try and address your question to, to an individual, if possible. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ziad. I'm a first year at uh, Columbia College. Um, sometimes uh, I hear about uh, local resistance to um, science-based or evidence-based treatments, especially with regard to communicable diseases because of uh, superstition or misinformation that uh, runs in the community. So I'm wondering, uh, is this something you also encounter with uh, NCDs? And how do you combat that, given that that's sometimes a problem in this country, too? Paul, you want to? Want... Yeah, I'm, I'm the medical anthropologist in the family. I didn't say that. But I think we, we see a lot of superstition, especially, for example, in California. <laughs> um, that, Ziad, is where I think we have an epicenter. No. Yeah, I'm from Berkeley. Uh, let, me, let, me, uh, <laughs> let me put it this way. I, I have no experience working as a physician for no, in, in anywhere in the world, whether rural Haiti or Boston. I, haven't, I don't have an experience where there is not, you know, there are not s socially constructed ideas that are at great variance with what we learned in medical school. And for that matter, what we learned in medical school is that great variance with what you might learn in medical school if in four years or so you go to medical school. So there's a, we, we, I think in looking at people's superstitions, to use that word, which is per perfectly fine with me, um, I think we have to understand that um, we still need to build programs, back to Wafa's point, systems that can allow us to bring tried and true uh, uh, interventions, whether they're prevention 
or diagnosis or care to bring those to scale. And I, I tell you, I learned this lesson the hard way um, when I was your age, about that time in Haiti. And, and if I could be allowed just a nanosecond, uh, I would say that I found out uh, that most of the patients who I saw who had tuberculosis, and this is in the 80s, when decades after the development of effective therapy, believed in uh, what I would call super, not what, what, the, what the local doctors actually called superstitious ideas or sorcery related ideas, but that it had absolutely no bearing on the outcome of their treatment if they had proper care. So if they had a community health worker, proper diagnosis, access to care, it didn't matter whether they believed it was caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis, as I did, or uh, sorcery. Um, so that really humbled me and, and taught me, in spite of the fact that I was studying anthropology, focus on building the programs, on building the systems. And, and that was a, you know, uh, something that I, has really guided me my whole life as a physician. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm, Kev I'm Kevin. I'm a junior in the School of General Studies. Uh, Lance had a question for you. In your life, uh, as you helped to build Livestrong, as you uh, faced cancer, and as you were a professional cyclist, you faced colossal challenges. Um, what was the most important thing you found as you faced these challenges, and how can I and other members in the audience develop such a, a quality? Hmm. Um, Hmm. You know, it, Livestrong started as, what, technically it started as the Lance Armstrong Foundation. It started as a couple of people volunteering in my buddy's living room, sitting around a computer and, and just hoping that we could raise a little bit of money and, and ultimately make some kind of difference. We didn't, we didn't imagine that it would evolve to what it has today. We didn't imagine that it would uh, turn into Livestrong and, and really adopt a color and, and have this brand and this, have this worldwide movement. Um, and same goes for cycling. The, the trick about cycling is that people, most people think that this is an individual game when it's not. It's a team game. And the team goes, for example, the Tour de France has nine riders, but you have probably 20 or 30 staff on, on the tour as well, so you have just this tremendous team moving down the road. The, my point is that both of those things, where Livestrong has gone from 1997 to today, and throughout those seven tours, it was all about the people. It was all about the organization that was in place. It was about the leadership. I could look at the tour and I could say, without Johan Bruniel, I never would have won the Tour de France. I could look at Livestrong and I could say, without Doug Ullman, Livestrong wouldn't be what it is today. So it's about you know, sort of being lucky to find the right people or picking the best people and then letting those leaders build this amazing team. And, and um, you know, I, I, take very, I take more credit when it comes to cycling, but when it comes to the foundation, I can take very little credit aside from the fact uh, that, that, that when I was diagnosed, I thought I've got to do something to help change somebody else's situation, whether that's one person or 100 people or 1,000 people. I don't know. But I, f I feel obligated to do that. Beyond that, uh, this team was led and, 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 and created and developed by, I mean, even Paul just leaned in when, when, when we were uh, listening to the earlier speakers. I mean, our organization, which is 85 people in Austin today, is unbelievable. I mean, I look at this organization, I walk in there and I have to run back out. I'm so intimidated a lot of times. <laughs> That's not They're entirely true. to us. Yeah. They're nicer to you. They're nice to us. <laughs> but um, it's all about the people. I mean, I think that's the, uh, the key message for me. It was the key, I, I do believe, was the key catalyst for both of those things to, to become reality. Thank you. And is, uh, is Doug Allman still here? I just, uh, he was standing back there in the corner. Doug? Is Doug here? Maybe he's not as got your back as well as you thought he did. <laughs> Anyways, Doug I'm is going to have uh, to live strong. Talk to him about that. Three-time cancer survivor, and, and like Lance said, really uh, has made this, uh, this organization hum. Please. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Carolina Ocampo. I'm a graduate student at the School of International Public Affairs here at Columbia. And I have a question that has two parts, kind of. Uh, so by putting this issue on the table here at the General Assembly, what are the expectations? And in developing countries, considering uh, the fact that they are willing, are planning to meet the Millennium Developing Goals by 2015, how do you conciliate uh, putting the uh, MCD, the NCDs, and addressing the Millennium Developing Goals? What do you expect from national governments? 
And, and, and let me, before you answer, uh, 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 let me just say we have about 15 minutes left. There's a lot of people uh, with, with questions. So uh, the, the first part of that question, Dr. Shulman, let me just throw to you. Do you have a specific expectation that comes out of, of this? You sort of talked about this before, but what, what do you hope next week when you reflect upon this, you're going to say comes out of all this? Uh, well, you know, I think panelists to my right, you know, when she talked about treating individual patients or the ability to scale up and what that would take is really one of the things that I hope comes out of this. I mean, Paul and I have treated people together for 20 years or so, um, people like Francine that we've been able to help. Uh, but we've, been, we've done it carrying pathology specimens in our suitcases and, you know, Shanghai chemotherapy from the Dana-Farber back to Rwanda and Haiti. And that's not really a scalable, successful plan. Uh, and we've done that because that's all we've had. And what I hope to have come out of this is the recognition by the global community that this is a problem that's important, it's a problem that we have tools to attack, uh, but we need help to do that, we need structure to do it, we need funding to do it, just like a decade ago they needed that for HIV AIDS. And, can, can I just add one thing? I, was, I, I, was, I went to the first one. And I got to say, that is uh, 10 years ago, that or thereabouts. I was there. I came with a Haitian delegation from Port-au-Prince. And I had limited expectations, I must say. Um, I mean, I had been to so many meetings. And you know, and there was meeting after meeting after meeting, and nothing was getting done. You know, this had become far and away the previous year. It surpassed tuberculosis, tuberculosis as the leading infectious killer of young adults. Wafa will remember these meetings. They're interminable. And, and, you know, people were dying. As President Clinton would say, they were dying like flies. And um, he says it better. Um, <laughs> but look what happened. Lee Bollinger, a master of uh, understatement, just said, you know, the results from the UNGAS were not unfavorable. And th what came out of UNGAS was the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. And this is my plea, you know, to all of us who are interested in everything from diabetes to major mental illness. Um, and mental illness is, is very neglected in this agenda. My plea is we can't pit pathologies against each other um, because people, as Wafa has taught us, people come in families and villages and communities. And, you know, we really need to pull together um, to move forward the NCD focus at the same time that we're do thinking about health systems. And one of the, one of the lessons learned, I, I agree with Paul, is also what was very important at the, the summit is to have some concrete things that the global community focuses on, like some real, obviously some funding commitments, but also setting goals and setting very clear objectives is very important because otherwise all of our aspirations will never go to action. And I think it'd be such a huge missed opportunity if there isn't uh, a commitment by the governments and commitment by the funders, but also linking this to some real concrete goals and objectives so that we can uh, hold people's feet, uh, have, what's the expression? To the fire. fire. Hold feet, people's feet to the fire and uh, have real deliverables uh, that uh, people have to make a commitment to achieve them. I think those were, that's a very important lesson that we've learned from HIV. I, I think you're all pretty good at holding people accountable, that's for sure. Uh, please, over here. Hi, my name is Jordan McKittrick. This is a question primarily for Dr. Farmer. Um, I'm an undergraduate here, and I had the good fortune of going to Inch 80, Haiti, uh, on a small medical mission near your clinic. Um, and I got to talk with many of the doctors and nurses on the trip, and afterward, many of them were demoralized that they hadn't contributed in the way that perhaps they thought they would be able to prior to the trip. Um, and my question to you is, as an undergraduate with no MD, no MPH, I'm not an economist, I don't have political power, um, what can a humble undergraduate like me do uh, when I should be the most demoralized one? Um, yeah on a trip like that to contribute? What can I do right here in, in, at Columbia to help the people of Inch? Yeah, well thank you first of all for, for going because, you know, going someplace, and that could be someplace in this city or someplace in central Haiti as you, as you saw, um, does stir up what Lance identified as a key ingredient here, and that's passion. And let me just say that in the last 10 years or less, undergraduates 
This started at, um, at, at Stanford. Now I have to take back making fun of Berkeley um, or California in general. I'm sorry that I did that. I, but I um, figured it was safe at Columbia. In, uh, it's in the last 10 years, undergraduates and later high school students, mostly in the United States but also in Canada, have raised uh, over $2 million for Partners in Health. So you in Hash, Central Haiti, surely were seeing some of the staff there would not be working there if not for undergraduates. And that's just one way, you know, and putting a, a, a topic on the agenda um, is, is really something I think student organizations and students can do just as well or better than anyone else. Thank you. Um, my name is Liza. I'm a senior in the college, and this question is mostly for Wafa and Paul. Um, I wanted to ask you guys what it is that we've accomplished in the last 10 years in treating communicable and infectious diseases. What, what are the things from that um, that we can translate and use in this fight for non-communicable diseases? The structures that we've built, the ideas that have come from that. Um, what not only can help the fight for non-communicable diseases, but also maybe what would take away from that fight? Yeah, great. I'll, I'll start and uh, certainly Paul can add. I think there are lots of lessons learned and that can be directly applicable. Uh, I start out, start out with one very important one, which is including the voice of the people. The voice of people affected by HIV was transformative. And focusing on the voice of communities and voice of the people, they need to shape the programs that we design. That's a very important lesson learned. I think the other lesson learned has, is a, that I've learned and we've learned is the importance of um, developing teams that work together. It's the workforce, what is the workforce? Sort of doing away with the hierarchy of a physician versus a nurse versus an outreach worker, that everybody's important, everybody works together as a team focusing on helping a family to achieve the health of that family. That's a very important lesson learned. I think there are other important lessons in terms of the model of care itself. Remember, HIV is a chronic disease. It's very similar to the chronic non-communicable diseases. And that meant that we had to transform completely how the clinics worked. Uh, it used to be you just have an acute illness, something hurts, you go to the clinic, somebody gives you a shot or a pill, and that was the end of the story. With a chronic disease like HIV, it means that you have to have a system. You have, a, have an appointment system. You have to have a, a system to go out and find people when they don't show up. You have to have a secure system where the medication is available in a reliable way. You have to have a system of a lab that actually functions, that can monitor people who are taking medications. You have to have the prevention people and the treatment people, and that was enabled to HIV, the counselors, and respecting the power of the counselors and the power of people who have the condition itself. So those are completely uh, adaptable lessons that we've learned uh, from HIV that I think should stimulate and hopefully jumpstart the response to NCD. There's absolutely no reason to reinvent the wheel. It would be a big mistake to reinvent the wheel. We can build on this platform, and that platform has been established in some of the poorest countries in the world, and it's poised with a bit of investment and a bit of vision and passion and commitment to really take us to the next level. Uh, but it is there, and it's, uh, it's, it's, I think that's the way we're going to translate our aspirations to true action and hopefully uh, to outcomes. And those are just a few examples uh, from what we've learned. A, um, do, do you want to well, answer I mean, we go on? We had this thing we used to, in the hospital, especially an attending physician you know, the, would write under the note written by the, the uh, trainee or a fellow, agree with above. So I agree with above. <laughs> Um, there's, I, I would just add one thing, and, it, and that's one of the reasons talking about involving people affected directly. That's why we're working with Livestrong. We're also grateful for the, the financial support that Livestrong and, uh, has, has given us in our work. Um, but I would add that without financial commitments, uh, this will not, this endeavor, like the platform, we've, in a way, what I think what Waf is saying is we've built this, we're proud of it. Please, let's use it for NCDs. Um, we do need an infusion of resources. If you look at the biggest developments um, that we've both uh, been part of and all of us have been part of, you know, the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, Malaria, and, the, and PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, have been hu huge, huge uh, contributors. It would not be possible to, have built, to build those platforms without those two programs. 
Thank you. Great. Uh, Phil Sutherland, Team Type 1, uh, NGO focused on diabetes advocacy and access to medicine now, uh, which another than Lance Armstrong here inspired back uh, when I was a kid in college in 2003. Um, but Paul, this question goes to you. Uh, you know, a big thing we, we've seen is you, know, you can have very strong health systems and continue to strengthen health systems, but if there's not access to the medicine, yeah. uh, it really doesn't do any good. Uh, we've recently had some success in the diabetes world about you know, working on different price structures for developing countries in uh, Rwanda, Macedonia, China, uh, and then now trying to scale those to the rest of the world. Is that something that you see uh, in oncology uh, in particular as an achievable goal? And then you know, working together with diabetes, cardiovascular, uh, oncology, uh, you know, to go to pharma and say, listen, we can create much more clientele for you if we develop different price structures for the people uh, in the developing countries. I mean, is that a focus that you'd like to do here? Um, it is a focus, and I'd like all of you to, to, to recommend Phil Sutherland's book, his, his, his memoir, which is called, and I love this, Not Dead Yet. And so you are not dead yet, by my calculation. Um, you know, type 1 diabetes is, is, you know, is also used to be called insulin-dependent diabetes. Some people still call it insulin-dependent diabetes. You can't treat it without insulin. And insulin requires, as you're saying, a procurement system and a way of really not just getting it to, to the uh, patients. I think community health workers and, and others who work with them, including nurses and physicians, could do that. But also, it requires reasonable prices. One of the great ironies of, of this work is that the prices of the deliverable, let's just say a chemotherapeutic agent um, like Levec, you know, and Larry will know the, the prices, there, or uh, treatments for acute leukemia or insulin or other diagnostics like the stuff you brought us in Rwanda, the strips and, and the, all of those are regarded astoundingly almost as, uh, you know, there, there's no, I've had, people say, well, there's no demand. So I've just told you that these are the leading, we've heard that these are the le leading killers of young adults in the world today, and, and, and yet there's no demand. What that means, of course, is some people are considered too poor to treat. The, the, uh, the, the pricing structure and uh, incentives have to be completely rethought, and one of the things we'd like to do is use the lessons learned around HIV and tuberculosis and malaria on uh, medications. The prices of those have dropped so precipitously since 2002. And we've got all the data and we've learned the lessons and we've worked with procurement agencies. So again, here's the platform and you've already helped us move this forward. This is not a message to you, Phil, but all of you um, who would like to be involved in this, we have learned a lot too about how to move forward, uh, how to lower prices and, and working with the, with the uh, pharmaceutical industry and also the generic industry. And if I, if I could just add, and you know, that one of the things that makes cancer different a little bit is that there are a lot of different cancers. There are dozens of different cancers, and the best treatments involve different drugs. But we've identified 29 what we consider to be essential anti-cancer drugs. 26 of those are off patent, and many of them have been around for decades and could be quite affordable uh, with some of the strategies that have just been talked about. So this is not that these are all brand new patented very, very expensive medicines is quite the contrary. So I think we have a lot of opportunity here, as you suggest, uh, and, uh, and we know what the drugs are. We just need to work with the industries to get them. And the second, uh, Paul, you told me you would do a bike ride with me. Uh, Lance, you think we get him a bike? And I'm, the Lance, to get this I'm, guy on it? I'm the Lance Armstrong of public health. That's it. <laughs> no bikes. We'll get you a bike. A little, a and, and, a, and a helmet. And a helmet, that's right. <laughs> uh, my name is Isidore Cerullo. I'm a junior in the college. Um, and in the face of the very real limitation of available material resources, how do you go about um, delegating those resources to create really um, effective change? And how do you prioritize the initiatives of this global movement so you're not all over the place, I guess? Dr. Shulman, do you want to, give, do you want to take, take a stab at that? I mean, specific, uh, in, in an era of limited resources, you're trying to address some of these problems. You, you already talked about the drugs, for example, 26 of 29 of them being off, off uh, patent. What, what, what other examples? Well, you know, I would say a couple of things about that. And you're, you're asking how we prioritize 
the work and what it's worth. And um, uh, you know, your dean made some comments about the cost of inaction, if you will, um, the the cause of uh, economic tragedy to you know have these diseases not treated effectively. If you take an 11 year old girl like Francine, and I could guarantee you that we could buy all of her chemotherapy for less than $100. Um, you know, she's now 15, four years later, uh, and she's got really what's a normal productive life and told me when I visited her in July she wanted to be a doctor and I don't doubt it. Uh, you know, how do you balance that economically? You know, to me, in the long run, that's a small investment. Now, there are limited resources, but I think that governments, ministries of health, and much of us around the world need to figure out how to divert some of the resources that are going elsewhere, if you will, uh, to situations that are really highly treatable and will pay both economic and personal dividends down the line. Um, it, you know, there's a longer discussion about sort of what I consider to be above the cut line for diseases that ought to be treated as a basic human right. Um, just like we've argued for infectious disease over the last decade. Um, and the, the I'm not an economist, um, but I know I think enough about it to know that actually what we need, the money we need to treat somebody like her, and the economic benefit in the long term, in some respects, makes it an easy equation. You know, I'm, I'm not, I can't resist saying this, uh, and I, it's, a, it's one line, but I don't mean it flipply at all. I mean, when someone like Joe Stieg, uh, Stieglitz um, and, and uh, Linda Bilmer, I think it's Bilmer, right, about the trillion dollar war. I mean, you know, that's, the war in Iraq is, is incredibly costly and it's tax dollars. I mean, just one, talking about one country. And I don't mean to be polemic, but I do think economists often have this very peculiarly bounded notion of what the world is and what the pie is. And, you know, that's okay, I guess, but I think you guys are in a university and you should have very critical, you're a junior, I think you said, right? You should have critical readings about the way that resources are allocate, allocated. Instead of making us fight with each other between cardio, you know, cardiovascular, not you personally, I don't think you did this, but instead of asking, <laughs> instead of asking doctors and public health people to argue about, you know, cardiovascular investments versus infectious disease or prevention versus care, we really need a much more honest discussion of the way the world's resources are spent. You know, people say we live in a time of re limited resources, but when was that not true, right? I mean, 19th century, seemed, you know, they were saying the same things perhaps. So I really have to beg you undergraduates especially, before you go into graduate studies in economics um, <laughs> to, and policy, to, to really challenge these, uh, received, this received wisdom. We'll take a, a couple more questions, please, over here. Hi, I'm Erwin Redliner. I'm on the faculty of the Mailman School of Public Health here and, and a pediatrician. I want to press the issue of uh, priorities just a little bit more. And I, 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 first of all, the initial comments about it's about time that we're dealing with these kinds of uh, diseases, these scourges worldwide is absolutely true, and that's, that's a starting point. Yet the, the question of priority setting is really complicated. And to Dr. Shulman's point, I, I don't think logic necessarily works. I mean, if economists are peculiar, politicians are I don't know how I would describe them exactly, but at the end of the day, somebody has to set priorities. Is, are we going to focus on clean water? Are we going to focus on building health systems? Are we going to try to conquer the still unconquered infectious and communicable diseases? And those, are, those decisions actually do matter. And the economy actually was better 10 years ago and 12 years ago. And certainly in Europe and in the United States, that is the case. So in good times and in bad times, we seem to have a great deal of trouble establishing priorities and doing what's right for the larger good. At the end of the day, though, we still need to know who sets those priorities and how is the case made? How, how exactly, what is the process? We, we do this with issues like this in the United States and develop, developing country, developed countries. It's even more complex in countries with limited resources. So who gets to say what's most important, what is the priority list, and and how is that determined at the end of the day? And how do you influence it as public health professionals? Well, 
I mean, I think the, it's a very good question. I think the, the issue has been, and, and also another threat is people focus on one thing and they think that, you know, we focus on HIV for the last decade. Well, the HIV agenda is not finished. It has right. to continue. And last year we were talking about maternal child health and now we're talking about NCDs and what are we going to talk about next year? So I, I agree with you. It's also the short memory and the short vision for objectives and goals is, is a major threat. I think in the end, you're talking about governance and you're talking about who's at the table making decisions. Uh, there is a strong movement, and I hope it's um, going to flourish even more, about the concept of what, what's called sometimes the country ownership, or uh, I call it people ownership, better than country ownership, but the, that the, the countries themselves, the poor countries or middle income countries, they need to be at the table uh, the representatives from the, not just the politicians, but I think also the representatives of the public health community and other communities and community of people, affected people, to come together and set an agenda and set a short-term, mid-term, and long-term agenda, and then seek the, the funds to try to achieve the goals that they set together. But it has to be, I, it has to be rationalized, it has to be based on evidence, it has to be both short-term and long-term, and I think it's, Politicians, unfortunately, often have a short-term, you know, uh, span in thinking because they have an election next year or the year after. So it has to be really driven by the communities themselves and public health and professionals and other people. And they have to think very carefully about what's the burden of disease in their communities, how we're going to set the priorities, what's doable, what's not doable, what's scalable, what's not scalable, and need to make choices. And, and, and I think that's the challenge. And that has to really happen in a very local environment. Uh, and I feel like sometimes when I'm traveling and I go into the countries where ICAP works, often they, I hear, we want to set our own agenda. I hear this again and again. We want to set our own agenda. We don't, we don't want the agenda set by the funders, yeah. which is complex because obviously a lot of them are supported largely, the programs are largely supported by external funders. So there's a happy compromise here but there needs to be a respect for the local voice and a multiplicity of local voices and coming up as a global community with some, some priorities that we make a commitment to, particularly I think what's very important is also the commitments that rich countries make uh, to addressing some of these issues. Uh, so it has to be from both ends. Yeah. I just wanted to make one other point. You know, um, at one point when I was visiting uh, a hospital in a resource poor area, you know, there is a 13-year-old boy with Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is a curable disease, who had already been in his hospital bed for six months, probably lived another two or three months, consuming health care resources. So, you know, if you don't treat these people, if you don't have the infrastructure and what you need to treat them uh, and turn them back into cured, productive people, they don't vanish in the thin air and cost society nothing. And I think that's an important part of the equation as well is uh, the concept that, well, you know, if we don't treat them, then they're not going to cost us anything. So, you know, that's what we're weighing treating them against. It's just not that way. And, and Dr. Redlin, uh, oh, did you, did you, uh, I, I don't know if that answered your question. I don't know if you can. Was there, was there something specific that you had, you had in mind uh, with regard to setting these priorities? Uh, I, uh, a few years ago, I was in the Black Lion Hospital in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia and uh, saw an entire ward full of children with rheumatic heart disease. And in the neonatal unit, there was one oxygen tank being shared <clears throat> among, I don't know, 30 kids and another floor full of children with malnutrition. So as a physician, you step back from that and say, what should happen first? Um, or how do we prioritize it? Or if I had a billion dollars, what exactly would I spend it on? This becomes a very real question of where do we, and you, there are analogies to this in anywhere, including here in the United States, but very acutely visible in developing countries. And same thing I saw in a hospital in uh, southwestern Uganda uh, a year and a half ago. But, but there is such an overwhelming array of communicable and non-communicable diseases. I'm not saying this to be depressing or to, you know, we, we devote our lives to trying to fix this. But somehow or another, the establishment of priorities and the fulfilling of those priorities and uh, the resources to deal with them, as Waf is saying, is, is critical. And it's right now, there's a vacuum. So if you went to the UN General Assembly and you had the stage, what exactly would you say that the world government should commit to first? And by the way, we still have uncommitted, 
uh, unfulfilled commitments even to responding to the earthquake in Haiti. So yeah. the problems are vast. The sea is large and the boat is small, as the Children's Defense Fund uh, uses as its motto. But the point is that somebody has got to be directive and clear about what should happen first. Can, can I just give to one? I do think there's cause for optimism, or maybe yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm the person who always, and I am optimistic, and I, <laughs> and I think there is reason for optimism. I find that in my travels over the past several years and working hand in hand with ministries of health and other key groups within many of the poorest countries, I see real um, serious conversations and real priorities that are being made on the ground. And I find that actually there are, for the first time, you find the, the groups are sitting around the table and they are diverse. I hate to use the term multi-sectorial, but they're diverse groups. They come together. They're trying very hard to look at data, to look at evidence, and come up with priorities. And some countries do it better than others. I don't know where our country falls in that spectrum. Uh, but I do think that there's reason for optimism is that uh, there is a seriousness and there is a commitment that I see to trying to really make some rational decisions. We need to work hand in hand and to garner the resources to enable uh, the countries themselves to achieve what they've, the priorities that they've set. Uh, but that requires, of course, raising the funds and so on. But I, I am optimistic that, again, this is a moment in time that's very different from 20 years ago or 10 years ago where there's a empowerment, there's, there are coalitions, that, that there's, a, there's reason for optimism that we can really achieve goals we set for ourselves. You got a quick, quick thing? Yeah, I was just going to say the same thing, that not only, we have, we're, not only were we able to cel celebrate Lance's 40th, um, but you know, there, we've seen in a lot of the places that we've worked, including some of the places that you mentioned, uh, no small amount of progress. Just to go back to the Rwanda example, so, I mean, and, and the, the Minister of Health of Ethiopia was trained here, if memory serves, right? Well, in the example of Rwanda, the National AIDS Program Director becomes minister. But in the interim, she and her others working with her in the ministry and their partners went from really under, in, in 2005, when, when you were in, in Ringuavu, maybe it was 2006, but around 2005, there were fewer than 500 patients receiving treatment for AIDS in, the, in publicly supported programs. It's now about 90,000 patients. That's pretty much the best example I can give you for universal access, not just in Africa, but anywhere. And they've built up health systems across that country on the way. And now, again, there's a platform that I think could do a lot more. Life expectancy in Rwanda in the last decade has gone up by 10 years. Um, maternal mortality has gone down. Rates of vaccination have gone up. And of course, they have recovered. I'm thinking about your tender-hearted comments about the country I care about even more, Haiti. But the Rwandans offer a fantastic example of recovery uh, that I think should serve as a beacon for many other places in the world. So I agree about the optimism, uh, and I know Lance must feel that way. That's why he's he's always with us in these in endeavors, and and others who've uh, who've you know been touched by successful interventions to treat malignancies. Lance, you are, you are one of the most optimistic people I know. When you come to an event like this and you see young people who are interested in this issue, a lot of them come because you're, you're here. What, what, how, what is the message you want to give them? If they want to do this sort of work, not, not just attend a conference, but devote their lives to this sort of thing, what do you tell them? Well, the commitment already started just by, uh, by your presence today, really. Um, <clears throat> but I understand, too, this idea that um, or this frustration that we get, and Dr. Shulman touched on it. I mean, we, uh, we've talked a lot about cancer today, and we've talked a lot about AIDS today. Um, cancer is a complicated disease, so there are days where I sit around and go, God, what, how long is this going to take? This is, when I was diagnosed in 96, I didn't think that I'd be sick. I thought we would have fixed it by now, or you guys up here would have fixed it by now. <laughs> um, but it, it is just, it's just so uh, complicated, and it's going to take, uh, a lot of work is going to take a complicated solution, whether it's early diagnosis or treatment or different types of treatments or uh, screenings or uh, multiple therapies. It's, 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 it's not going to happen overnight. And so we got to, um, you know, with that, you have to have um, strong people and strong passion, as we touched on a second ago. But, um, you, know, you know, we, you know, Lance, as, as did everybody on the panel, um, our colleague Felicia Knoll, who 
another survivor, in her case of breast cancer, um, who is a health, back to my colleague's uh, question, who's a, a health economist and has worked with us, um, as have many people like Chris Murray and others here at Mailman School, to really try and set those priorities. I think that's another cause for optimism. And the clinicians like me and Larry and Wafa, we're going to end up doing this work anyway. I mean, we have to. It's our job to be there. And, 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 uh, and Sanjay, too, uh, who was there, actually, all levity aside, as a clinician after the earthquake in Haiti. And so we're going to be there, and nurses and social workers, all the frontline workers, community health workers, we don't have a choice, nor do we seek one. But getting the health economist on board is really exciting. I think Jeff Sachs of this university has done us all a big service, um, certainly those of us in infectious disease. Again, I don't even think of myself as an infectious disease. Those of us who are in, in, in responding to the huge burden and gap uh, of any afflictions that uh, hit poor people disproportionately. We have a great uh, debt to Jeff and other forward-thinking economists. We need a lot more uh, workers in the vineyard. If, if this were the uh, Academy Awards, they'd be playing the music right now. So I'm gonna about to wrap it up. But I think some of the panel will stick around to answer. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions. Uh, but just how about another warm round of applause for this for this panel? Again, very, uh, very heartening to see so many people turn out to, to talk about this topic that I think is so, so close to all of our hearts. Thanks so much for coming. Appreciate it.